Well, thank you all for coming this morning. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to see some old friends and hopefully over the course of time make some new ones. Uh, let me just say first of all that I want to congratulate Paul Guzzi on his long and storied and terrific leadership for the Greater Boston Chamber, which, um, Paul, how many years has it been? 19 years. Um, wow, think about all that's gone on over the course of that 19 years, Paul. Well, congratulations and thank you very much. You know, it's been, uh, it's been kind of a whirlwind a few months here. What I thought I might do is just talk a little bit about um, sort of three big areas that uh, are sort of how I frame and think about uh, starting, our, starting our term here. The first is the people are policy. The second is you need to make a good first impression. And the third is don't be surprised when you get surprised. Because that's just one of the things that happens in public life. Now, with respect to people or policy, we've spent a fair amount of time building our cabinet over the course of the past uh, couple of months. Uh, it's a very bipartisan team. In fact, so bipartisan that I've managed to make people mad on both sides, which is sort of a key indicator for me that I'm doing the right thing. Um, almost everybody, uh, I think, at this point would agree that the folks we've asked to serve in our administration and who gratefully and thankfully said yes are people who have tremendous subject matter expertise in the areas that we've asked them to oversee and work with us on. They have management experience and leadership experience, and they have a pretty strong combination of public and private sector experience that they can bring to the table. From our point of view, one of the keys here was we wanted a diverse group of people who could sort of have at it and have it out on the issues of the day, and in the end, bring their backgrounds and their knowledge uh, to bear on behalf of the Commonwealth of Mass and do it in a way that would give us what I would describe as a far more rich uh, debate and conversation that we might have if we just had one point of view at the table. Now I know some of them are here this morning, but this is a big room and I wasn't allowed to come in and shake anybody's hand beforehand. Th this is probably in some respects, some of the people say to me all the time, what surprises you the most and all the rest. I'm a people person, okay? I like people. I like talking to people. I like hearing from people. When you're the governor, no one will let you do that anymore. <laughs> you can't just walk into a room and say hello. It's really been a fascinating learning experience for me. But in any event, so therefore I don't know how many members of my administration are actually here today. So I'm going to take attendance. <laughs> Jay Ash. Actually, work. 
worked pretty hard for my opponent um, during that period between the election and the inauguration. And this, for many people, was surprising. Not so much for me, my view on this is pretty simple, which is elections are competitions. When the elections are over, you actually have to get into the business of governing. Uh, I spent a fair amount of time talking to a lot of people and visiting a lot of places where uh, there were plenty of people who didn't support me when I ran for governor. But my view on that is, uh, and I said this throughout the course of the campaign, my job is to represent 100% of the people in Massachusetts who are fortunate enough to get elected. And we spent a fair amount of time not just talking to people who supported us during the race, but also to a lot of people who didn't, because that's in some respects the way we think this is supposed to work. We also put together an inaugural that included a whole series of events around the Commonwealth where we went and visited programs at work, uh, and especially programs at work um, in uh, difficult circumstances. One of my great suppositions, and I'll talk a little more about this at the end, is we need to do a better job of recognizing what works and do more of it. Um, everything is not the same. Everybody has to deliver the same product. At the end of the day, we need to focus on finding those people who are truly do doing outstanding work on behalf of the people of the Commonwealth and find a way to do more with them. The second thing I did was I um, picked a smaller office. Now this is an interesting issue because um, I think the governor's office is a beautiful room. It's historic, it's gorgeous, and it would scare me to death to actually spill a cup of coffee in there or put my feet up on the desk or hang a photo of my kids on the wall. We'll certainly use that room for plenty of ceremonial activities. And I'm trying to figure out some way to make it part of the State House tour because I'd like to give the people in Massachusetts an opportunity to see what they paid for uh, when that room got refurbished and, and, uh, and renovated. But I want my office to be like the kind of place where anybody could walk in the door be immediately comfortable, including me. And as a result, I took one down the hall, and, uh, and I plan to spend most of my time there. The other interesting thing I learned is if I miss a day of work, people notice. <laughs> Seriously? And I promise you, that will never happen again. And then finally, to make a really good first impression, I thought it was critically important that we win the Super Bowl. <laughs>
state police, I call folks to transportation, and I'm realizing that every day is not going to quite be what you think it's going to be. We then end up uh, on a Saturday afternoon, my phone rings, and it's to set up a phone call to talk about a snowstorm. So we get on the phone, and National Weather Service is on there. I'm like everybody else. I have never believed the weatherman or the weatherman ever about anything. And the National Weather Service gets on there and says, it's going to be in a storm storm. You're going to get somewhere between two and three feet of snow. <laughs> yeah, sure we are. Uh, yeah. I know you guys love when it snows, but. Um, so then we have another call. I said, we need to talk about this. We have another call later on Saturday. Yeah, it's still 24 to 36 inches across the yeah, sure, okay. So then by Sunday morning, they're, 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 they're on message, they're sticking to it, they're not budging, and I'm starting to think that this might actually be for real, and everybody's mobilizing and organizing, and, um, and then we had a very intense conversation about the travel ban. And I, I sounded actually a lot like my father, or a lot like, not so much my father, because my father's a really smart guy, some other father. Um, <laughs> where I was saying, I've been alive for 58 years, and 58 years has only been one travel man, blah, blah, blah. Um, but the message, the overwhelming message coming from all the experts inside the administration is, you really need to put a travel ban in place. So eventually we decided to do that, make sure we have enough time to communicate it uh, to everybody we need to communicate with, and uh, off we go to the bunker. Framingham. By the way, um, in the 1950s, the federal government urged every state in the country to build a bunker. Two did. <laughs> <Only one. laughs> it was the strangest thing to walk down into the ground and then all of a sudden, poof, there's all this stuff going on. Big bullpen, tons of offices. Um, I think there's also uh, Steve, isn't there a morgue down there, too? That's how long people plan to stay in the bunker sometimes. <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> down we go to the bunker, and there's maybe 10 or 15 people there. And, um, and I start getting briefed by Kurt Schwartz and the folks at, at MEMA about the process. And then the state police folks show up, and then the DEP folks show up, and then the DPU people show up, and then the energy folks show up, and then the uh, transportation people arrive, and, and everybody, the really interesting thing about this is everybody knows what seat they're supposed to be in, everybody knows basically what their role is. This is a movie they've all seen before, uh, participated in, and, um, and just watching this thing develop and play out at a staff level as I was sitting in this big bullpen was very informative because um, there's not a lot of wasted motion, Everybody seems to be getting along. The interagency stuff has already been written and agreed to because it's all part of the emergency orders that they already have in place. All their email lists work. They actually communicate with the people they think they're supposed to communicate with. And, uh, and the whole thing just rocks when you watch this thing play out. It was, it was fascinating. And I ended up spending the better part of uh, two days out there as we went through this and came away tremendously impressed with uh, both the quality of the, of the conversation and more importantly the, um, the knowledge and the experience, the deep experience that the people who are involved in this brought to the task. Um, and in some respects it gave me a, uh, a certain confidence and comfort that we could work our way through uh, another one of these. Little did I know. Um, and the big lesson I took of course from the second one is there is a cumulative impact of this stuff, and especially uh, for the, the transit system. Um, Stephanie Pollock, Stephanie Pollock's a very funny woman. She, um, she said to me at one point, one of the calls, you do realize, of course, that some of the trains out there people rode on during the blizzard of 78. <laughs> Certainly one way of helping me understand the point you're trying to make. Um, and then the final big surprise, although it wasn't that big a surprise, was the fact that there was a budget deficit. I think the big surprise to all of us was the size of the deficit. 
765 million plus or minus, uh, driven by a lot of things, but one of the main pieces to this was the botched rollout of the uh, Affordable Care Act and the uh, implementation of the, of the connector. That created a sort of a, a requirement almost in some regards that the Commonwealth offer interim mass health coverage to hundreds of thousands of people, and those cost drivers represent a big part of the issue associated with the deficit. Now, um, just to put this in perspective, Health and Human Services is about a $19 billion secretary. Overall spending in Health and Human Services in this fiscal year is going up about 8%. The Mass Health Program uh, represents about $13.5 billion of that $19 billion. And spending on Mass Health is going up 13% this year. 13%. Uh, that would be a very big year-over-year -year increase, and certainly one that's not sustainable. The other, point to make, the other point to make here is that the rest of Health and Human Services, which is about a $5.5 million collection of programs and activities, that went up 2%. 2%. So everything else that goes on in Health and Human Services went up 2%. Mass Health went up 13%. The Secretariat overall went up by 8 one of the major initiatives we're going to be pursuing as an administration is a whole series of reforms with respect to the Mass Health Program because it's critical not just for the Mass Health Program but for the rest of Health and Human Services and the rest of state government and local government, by the way, that we bring this program into some degree of financial sustainability and integrity because if we don't solve that problem, we're going to create all kinds of issues for ourselves everywhere else in the state budget. There are a lot of issues associated with this, but certainly one of them is the Commonwealth, because of the failure of the rollout, went over a year and a half without actually redetermining eligibility for the program. Um, we did get permission from the federal government to start doing that right now, and as long as we get it done by the end of the year, um, I think we'll be okay with that, which is really important since they pay for 50% of the program. But the other point I would make with respect to this is there are a lot of people who actually have coverage right now who are doubly enrolled. They have private coverage. Since no one on the mass health side has ever asked them if they have other coverage, they're continuing to be carried on mass health programs, so they're doubly covered. Um, there are a whole series of issues associated with this program. We're going to have to dig deep into them. We have hired a terrific person to run the connector, Luis Gutierrez, who was the chief information officer for the Commonwealth of Mass when I was secretary of ANF and also the Chief Information Officer at Harvard Pilgrim when we went through the process of um, solving a very messy and significant technology problem when I was there. He knows a ton about healthcare, he knows a ton about technology, and uh, he knows a ton about government, and he's exactly the right kind of person to help us work our way through that. We also hired um, a fellow by the name of Dan Tsai to be the head of the Medicaid program. Dan is a, he is now a former McKinsey consultant um, who was the head of their state payer practice. So he's been involved with Medicaid reform initiatives in many, many states around the country and has as good an insight and visibility into what's going on with respect to Medicaid around the rest of the country as anybody. And they are going to have their hands full. Um, but the work that they do in particular is going to be incredibly important to our ability to deal with our fiscal circumstances, period. Now, when we went into this job, we basically said we weren't, weren't going to raise taxes or cut local aid or homeless programs or the Department of Children and Families. And those were commitments we basically made over the course of the campaign, and we intended to honor them. We wanted to make sure we were thoughtful and sensitive about how we went about dealing with some of these spending issues, including protecting the rest of those core health and human service programs. The solution, which many of you have probably read about, is a combination of uh, revenues and spending reductions, about $250 million on the revenue side and about $510 million on the spending side. Some of it involved things we did literally two days after taking office. We put a hiring freeze in place. It's always better, in my opinion, not to fill a job you can't afford to pay for than it is to lay somebody off who had nothing to do with getting into the problem that you have in the first place. Um, we also went back and looked at all of our state contracts. Any contract that had been amended, we took a look at to determine what we might be able to do with respect to that, um, and began sort of a top to bottom review of uh, all of our state agencies, and also created a uh, 
a sort of framework for pursuing this, which involved things like if a program hasn't actually been started yet, but if money has been appropriated for it, stop. Because once again, it's much easier to stop something that hasn't been started than it is to stop something that's actually going concern. There were a fair amount of those, believe it or not, floating around in the, um, in the budget. In addition to that, we also made a decision um, to limit the impact of, um, of any of these decisions on what I would describe as programmatic services. And any time we had an opportunity to squeeze an admin activity, we pursued that instead. We also took a 10% cut on our budget uh, in the governor's office and uh, started talking to the Senate President and the House Speaker about this very early on. And I think we've done a pretty good job of keeping them informed about our thought process on this and how we're going to go about taking what we've done now, put it in front of them. And by the way, we now have to put together a fiscal 16 budget, which is due to the legislature on March 4th, which at this point feels like tomorrow. Um, actually, maybe it is. Um, and, we'll be, um, and we'll be working off of the changes we made in fiscal 15 as our baseline for developing fiscal 16. Now, with all this activity and everything we've done, the final point I make about the budget, we're still talking about overall a 7.7% year-over-year increase in state spending in fiscal 2015. That's just not sustainable over time. Um, we have a pretty good economy. We have a relatively low unemployment rate. The state tax revenue is not going to grow by 7% a year. Four and a half, five and a half, yeah, maybe six, not 7.7, .7, not eight. So one of our major objectives to restore sort of fiscal integrity in fiscal 2016 is going to be make sure we put together a budget that actually creates a sustainable platform on which people can, predict, be predict, can make predictability decisions about where we are and where we're going going forward. I do believe that we have bipartisan interest in solving this both this year and next year, and we're looking forward to working with the legislature on that. And it is vital that we get this right because setting that platform has a lot to do with how we actually go about the process of making the sorts of investments we'd like to make going forward and sending the kind of signals and messages to our businesses, to our cities and towns, to our startups, and to everybody else about where we are and where we're going. Now, with respect to the economic agenda, I'll just say a couple things. One is um, the strength of the dollar is, is, a, uh, is an interesting issue for us because we have a lot of businesses that send a lot of product around the globe. And a strong dollar obviously means the price of our products here in the Commonwealth um, becomes slightly less competitive, which means we need to work even harder on the things we can control. Um, we will be pursuing, we froze regulations on the day we came in. We are going to pursue, once we get past the filing of the budget, a pretty aggressive regulatory review process. Um, Jay Ash and some of his folks will probably be leading the train with respect to that. So if you have a particularly gnarly regulation you'd like to talk to somebody about today, he's standing right there, folks. And, um, and I'm sure there's nothing Jay likes more than a really deep conversation about regulatory policy. Right, Jay? Right, yeah. Um, we are also going to work on developing what we, we're describing as a regional approach to our economic development strategy. What works in Barnstable County is not necessarily what works in Bristol or in the Berkshires. And one of the things we would like to do is lay out our approach to economic development on a region-by-region region basis because every region is not the same. They have different strengths. They have different opportunities. Um, they have different gaps. Um, and we want to build our strategy with respect to the local business community and to local, uh, local officials around what works in each region and take it from there. Um, we also are going to pursue a series of initiatives around that competitiveness issue that Paul talked about. The biggest one coming out of the gate is going to be energy. Um, I've already had conversations with most of the other New England governors about this. Because we all operate on a regional grid, it's important that we be uh, working and collaborating as a team when it comes to this, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to sit down uh, later this month as at the uh, National Governors Association meeting in Washington and have a thorough debrief and discussion about energy policy, because this is one where um, 
we really do need to depend on each other across this region if we're going to develop a successful strategy to deal with the fact that at a point in time when many sources of energy are actually dropping in price because Massachusetts and New England haven't been able to create the kind of uh, capacity to actually access a lot of this energy, we're seeing our prices go up 30 and 40 percent for families and small businesses, which obviously for a state that was already very expensive from an energy point of view is a problem. We're also going to be very aggressive about pursuing the transparency agenda that I've talked about for a long time with respect to health care. Same service, same person, same outcome. Four different providers within a few miles of this hospital, this uh, institution can vary in price by as much as three or four hundred percent. We have to fix this part. And, uh, and I think a big part of fixing this starts with shining a lot of light on the differentials that exist. Um, most people, I don't think, have a sense about how significant and how important this piece of the equation is. Um, we're going to work real hard to make transparency across the healthcare system a very fundamental trademark of, of who we are and what we're all about. Um, final point I make on this is we've also spent a fair amount of time talking to our partners in city governments. Um, I would really like to uh, to come up with a series of strategies and initiatives that are tied very aggressively and specifically to, uh, to cities. I spent a lot of time, I think as most people know, talking to Mayor Walsh here in Boston. But we've also spent a lot of time talking to mayors across the Commonwealth. I'm actually going up to spend some time with Dan Rivera and Lawrence later today. Um, I spent a bunch of time in, in other municipalities and other urban communities. Karen Polito, uh, my lieutenant governor, when she's been able to actually get around the Commonwealth when it hasn't been snowing, has been sp spending a fair amount of time uh, building and discussing a variety of initiatives with mayors across the Commonwealth as well. We really think this has to be a fundamental part about the way we think about economic development, and we're going to be pursuing it pretty hard. Um, with respect to the Chamber, we would love your help on energy initiatives. We'd love your help on health care. We'd love your help on education. Um, we have a lot to do in education. Jim Pizer. Is Jim here? She's Jay here. Jay, you're going to get a lot of points here, bud. Um, <laughs> Jim is uh, a real reformer, a real innovator, a real leader in education, and, um, and he is a fountain of ideas. And um, we are going to have a lot to say and a lot to do on education, especially when it comes to dealing with the achievement gap, um, the affordability of higher education, and getting more aggressive about how we leverage and use online tools to enhance the education and student experience going forward, and we're going to look forward to working with organizations like the Chamber on those kinds of initiatives. I think we've already demonstrated we really don't care about where a good idea comes from. Um, we plan to be as accessible as we possibly can be as an administration. We've had a lot of people tell us that um, what we consider to be sort of standard operating procedure with respect to our outreach and our communication um, has been terrific. That's not going to change. We're going to continue to be as open door in administration as we possibly can be. We don't have all the best ideas. We're going to get a lot of them from other people. And that's in part because one of our fundamental working assumptions is that we should do more of what works. Now, last night, I was one of the speakers at the graduation ceremony for uh, the annual graduation at Year Up. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with Year Up, Year Up was started bunch of years ago by a fellow by the name of Gerald Tritavian. He was an entrepreneur who had been enormously successful. And he wanted to create a, a program that would provide uh, mostly inner city kids, um, high school graduates, um, or folks who had their GED, with a very fundamental education in certain fields where he knew they could find opportunities for work. And so they focused pretty aggressively on technology and uh, healthcare and, uh, and finance. They've developed a lot of very deep relationships with a number of businesses around the country. They have a pretty decent sized platform and footprint here in Boston. By the way, is there anybody here from State Street? State Street is one of Europe's biggest corporate partners and, uh, you know, 
God bless you, because it was very clear last night, listening to those kids talk who are graduating, that many of them are going to work at State Street, many of them interned at State Street. State Street has been a tremendous provider of mentors to support the kids who are working through those programs, and you are doing a fabulous job for a great program that is really changing the lives of a lot of those kids. So congratulations and kudos to you. Thank you. Now, I met a lot of these kids last night, and I've been to Europe a bunch of times. Um, but I'll give you a quick statistic. There were 110 kids in this graduating class. It's a one-year program, okay? Um, and their life stories were enormously compelling. 72 of them already have a job. There's, little, there's literally no doubt that 80 or 90 of them will have a job within the next couple of months, and the others will probably continue in some sort of four-year program, education program. The average pay for those 72 kids who have a job is $17 an hour. Most of these kids came from families where the average family income was 10 grand. 10 grand. There are 10,000 year-up alums around the country now, and over 2,000 here in Boston. And those year-up alums become part of the network that supports those kids coming into the program going forward, and they also become the ambassadors for the program in companies like State Street and Fidelity and Harvard University and other places where, um, where Europe is operating. We should do more of this. There are great programs, I've said this a million times, there are great programs all over the Commonwealth of Mass. All programs are not the same. We need to do a better job of working with great programs to make them bigger and better. Because when you find a great program that can actually deliver and has a model that works, we should be trying to replicate. And by the way, I would say to everybody in this audience here, if you don't know about Year Up, you should learn about it. And if you're not involved with them, you should get involved. One of the first things I did coming out of that commencement last night was call somebody in the administration up and say, we should be a business partner with these people. These kids are terrific. And boy, oh boy, shouldn't we be demonstrating the same sort of commitment to a great program like this as an employer here in the city of Boston that we would like to see other people demonstrate. Now the world economy, of course, may be something that's slightly beyond our control, but one of the things we have done a nice job of, and I hope we can continue to do this going forward, is bring more of the world to Massachusetts and Boston and vice versa. And I see Tom Glenn sitting right in front of me there. So I just want to say, Tom, to you, um, how terrific it is that Hainan Airlines is the newest and latest and greatest addition to the long list of new airlines and new cities that you folks have brought to Logan's uh, sort of footprint over the course of the past four or five years. And that is going to be a significant part of how we continue to build our brand uh, and make Massachusetts and Boston special and unique in the global economy. So Tom, thank you very much for what you and Massport have been up to. <laughs> and the final thing I'll say, and I'd be happy to take some questions, um, we have a lot of work to do, there's no question about that. Um, but if we focus on doing more of what works and really apply ourselves to those big three, what are we going to do with respect to improving our economy in every region of the Commonwealth? What are we going to do to make sure that our education system is affordable and excellent across the Commonwealth? And what are we going to do to make sure every community is a place where people really feel like they can build a future and make a life? we will be in an even greater place than we already are today. Thank you very much.